welcome everyone to today's industry webinar, Optimizing Local. We call it an industry webinar because once a year we invite not only our broadcast members, but our media agency partners, measurement companies, system providers, and yes, even some of the press to join us on a webinar looking at the conditions and the forecast and the future advancement of local broadcast television. Today's webinar is sponsored by TVB's Thought Leader Program participants, and we are grateful to BIA Advisory Services, Imagine Communications, and VIDIA for their participation all year long in our Thought Leader Program. You'll notice if you get our news read, our news wrap weekly attribution and aggregation uh, letter that we send out, our newsletter with stories of the week and the most important stories of the industry, that virtually every week you'll have a question and an answer from one of our thought leader partners. So pay attention to those and all of these folks are available to you now and in the future for additional Q&A that may come up. The way we're going to do today's webinar is that we're going to hear from each of our thought leader companies and we're going to weave together the construct of what's going on in our industry. So Rick Ducey is Managing Director of BIA Advisory and Rick is going to start our, us off talking about an industry forecast and key areas for growth and development. He'll be followed by Steve Reynolds, who's the president of Imagine Communications, and Steve will be then talking about seizing those opportunities for growth by using optimization tools. And finally, we'll hear from Sharita Williams, who will wrap it all up for us as president of Vidya, and Sharita will talk about automated TV and how that enables an easy and efficient buy-sell process to maximize local media strategies. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the ball to Rick, who will jump in with BIA's presentation. Rick? Abby, thank you so much, and it's always delightful to be part of these webinars and uh, part of this industry-facing uh, conference, and a uh, great pleasure to be here today with you, Shreda, and Steve as well. So I thought um, when we talk about optimizing local um, to get to um, kind of the core of what that means, it basically means uh, where does local TV find growth and then how does it get there? Uh, so that's what I want to focus on, kind of the numbers. So I'll talk a little bit about what we at BIA are seeing as um, ad spending growth uh, in different parts of the um, media business and call out what we're seeing, particularly in local TV, of course, and in some of the other areas, and talk a little bit about why we're seeing some growth in those areas and how local TV operators can um, see that and take some advantage of it to optimize what they're doing in local and therefore grow their opportunities. So I'll start off with a couple of um, big picture snapshots. <clears throat> um, our forecast for, for this year, 2019, we're expecting the total ad spend targeting local audiences across the 16 media platforms, uh, eight digital and eight uh, traditional uh, platforms, to end up just shy of $150 billion uh, this year. Uh, and if you look at how that breaks out, that $148.8 billion, um, a good dose of it is, is uh, our various digital categories, and that's mobile and online and OTT and, and anything that's kind of digital, uh, search, display, uh, listings, all of that goes into that blue bucket on the right. That's about 40%, uh, 4 to $10 targeting local audiences goes into those digital categories. And then the traditional media categories, local TV, radio, newspaper, cable, and so on, um, still uh, take the bulk of the spend uh, we're seeing for this year, 2019. Let me jump ahead, and our forecast goes out uh, several years to 2023, and here we can see some dynamics. The digital side of the pie has grown from 40% to almost half, almost one out of two dollars targeting local audiences now is going to go to these various digital platforms. Overall, the spend will grow from about $148 billion to about $20 billion to $168 billion. So the, the pie is growing, um, and digital is taking a bigger slice of that pie, uh, almost half of it. So that's kind of what we're seeing top level. Let me dig in a little bit and show some different categories here. If we look at video specifically, <clears throat> uh, local TV gets about two-thirds of the spend 
um, across all the different video categories. So that's how this year is going to end up, and um, I'll talk in a bit about where we're seeing 2020 go, particularly with um, political spending. So that's good news. TV is still foundational. But what we do see is that uh, by 2023, uh, the TV share, that total video spend targeting local video audiences, um, is going to shrink a little bit uh, in favor of some of these digital categories, uh, local online video, which um, basically for us means uh, PC-based video, laptop-based video, and mobile video, um, which we're including tablets in that along with smartphones. And then digital out-of-home video uh, is, is a growing category as well. So a couple of different ways to look at this. The ad pie is increasing, so TV gets some of that. But here we're going to break this out through a couple of different platforms. TV online, um, which for, for TV operators, um, mostly that's websites and mobile app um, ad revenue, and then TV OTA, the over the air. So we're seeing the orange bars 2023, some shrinkage in the core uh, ad segment of over-the-air broadcast uh, advertising, a little bit of growth uh, on the TV online side. But if you look at what's happening overall in the ad spending in local markets, uh, mobile uh, and local online we see are really where the growth is. So why is that? And, you know, we're seeing uh, the workflow systems, the data systems, uh, and the ability to target and get attribution data from advertising investments in mobile and online are becoming increasingly sophisticated, well accepted, and integrated into the workflow on the buy side and the sell side. So that's part of what, it, what attracts um, this increased ad spend. And then frankly, um, that's where more eyeballs are going to these platforms. And so advertisers, um, in fact, are chasing um, after these eyeballs where they can find them. Uh, if we look at this uh, a slightly different way, um, again, if you see where the mass of money gets spent, it's still local TV. Uh, and local TV does grow. It grows between 2019 and 2023. We're showing um, just shy of um, $18 billion for this year, uh, 2019, and by 2023, we like to compare odd to odd or even to even years since we have that even year um, lift with uh, uh, political and then Olympics and, and some other cyclical factors that come in there. So yeah, TV is going to grow. Um, and it's off a huge base, so that's nice to see. Uh, but again, if you look at those top bars, uh, uh, out-of-home video, mobile video, and online video are all going to grow more. And in fact, uh, those various digital platforms, again, emphasize that the absolute spend still weights towards local TV. Uh, but still, those local video platforms are growing almost three times as fast as TV. So there's something there. Uh, if, if TV wants to get to growth, it needs to understand what's happening in these other segments and then uh, how, how to get there. So that's just uh, setting kind of a baseline there. And I'll talk a little bit about our political forecast. Uh, we released our first political forecast, and we're saying for 2020, um, that election cycle, overall about six and a half, a little bit more than six and a half billion dollars will be spent. And about half of that will go to local TV. Um, again, very foundational in, in political campaigns, as with most campaigns. Uh, and digital is going to take a nice piece of that, uh, about where it is now, 21% um, overall. Radio and cable will take some. And in the slide down there at the bottom, we call out uh, some of the specific markets. Now, when we talk uh, about digital, at the moment, um, I know in the video space, so much is happening with over-the-top video. So we are going to do a separate breakout of uh, local ad spend on OTT platforms. Uh, that should be coming out relatively soon, we hope. Uh, we're trying to uh, square away our methodology and get some data sources and sort out our um, drivers in the model. But we're, we're getting close to something that we think can be released. So that OTT spend right now um, and our forecast goes into the digital categories. We see it as digital, not traditional TV. Um, but that um, is where some of the spending um, will be tracking in the forecast, and I think we'll show some interesting results there as you start to get into that. So um, kind of takeaways, how does TV optimize local? Again, basically what this means is where is the growth in local ad spend and how can TV take advantage of it? Uh, I'll start with a few thoughts here, and then I know Steve and then Sharita are really going to dig into this to say, here's how you actually do this. So just some top line thoughts. TV is hard to buy. Um, it's, it's very relationship driven. It's uh, relatively complicated. Uh, for people trying to understand it that aren't used to it, that are uh, maybe used to buying uh, digital. 
The, there are a lot of workflow steps. Uh, it's complicated to do the pre-buy, the buy, and the post-buy relative to how, I guess, quote unquote, easy or at least easier digital has becoming um, into the marketplace with all of the innovations there. Uh, the thing that's curious is that TV is so foundational, but digital media tend to get a lot of the press and top of mind uh, awareness. Uh, showing TV is foundational, meaning it's top of the funnel for, from a brand perspective, but from an activation perspective, it's also pretty critical because there's more research that shows, and I think local TV sellers and buyers can feel confident that those downstream metrics uh, like website traffic, search lift, and even foot traffic uh, to retail points of presence, uh, TV drives those downstream digital and actual physical um, campaign elements as well. So selling TV is foundational, but linking it directly in to digital extensions and even physical footfall to uh, places of business uh, makes a lot more sense than just selling just the value proposition of TV alone. People are doing multi-camp planning and execution and um, attribution analysis, so that's uh, a critical part of it. And the last thing, just through the grab bag, we have a, a coverage area we call advanced TV, which includes everything about TV beyond traditional TV. So that's ETSC or next-gen TV, it's over the top, it's addressability, it's attribution, all of those tools that are pretty familiar, um, relatively trusted and well used on a digital side, they're in and coming into TV in greater force um, in coming years. You're going to hear a lot about that next. That's a really critical space uh, for TV to innovate. Um, getting into OTT, getting into automated workflow, and uh, making it easier to plan, buy, and post the whole um, TV space. So with that, I'm going to um, I'll leave you with those thoughts and uh, the data points. Feel free to get in touch with me if any of this um, you'd like to follow up on. Happy to do that. Uh, these are some of our favorite things to be thinking about. So with this, Abby, let me turn it back over to you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Rick. That was, that was a terrific overview and, and very um, important of the, the key points that we're looking at. Let me ask you a quick question before we move on. You know, you really indicate a lot of money going um, to digital, especially during this new political cycle that's coming up in 2020. With TV stations, digital assets, and so many different opportunities for advertisers, um, do you have any suggestions on how they participate in that bucket of dollars? Well, sure. And in fact, our, our political forecast sort of falls in line with uh, some of the other ones that are out there. But um, as I think you're kind of hinting at, we do see digital um, a little bit more aggressively uh, getting some of that political spend. And uh, it varies by, by uh, group, uh, but for the most part, uh, what we're seeing is the digital side of TV stations tends to be the, the websites and the apps which uh, you can do targeting, uh, and a lot of times um, local stations will do uh, audience extensions to uh, get more impressions so there's more targetability. So definitely that makes a lot of sense in the marketplace. And then we're seeing some groups uh, moving into that OTT space that we currently at the IA don't pro provide a lot of visibility into from an advertising forecast perspective. But like I said, we're going to come out with that. But uh, that the connected TV market is uh, getting very connected uh, literally in terms of viewers, but also in terms of data, um, advertising attention, and what uh, uh, TV operators are doing. There's a lot of movement. I mean, you see CBS and Viacom reconnecting. That's going to affect uh, their OTT and streaming um, strategy. And same thing, I mean, pretty much all the major groups have an OTT strategy as part of the overall digital strategy. That uh, ability to extend reach of the audience to these other platforms and other content sources that they're using and more targetability and more attribution, those are all elements of a key growth success formula. Perfect. And uh, that's a great segue into Steve's presentation now. Um, Steve, as I mentioned, is president of Imagine Communications, and Steve's going to be talking to us about seizing those opportunities for growth. Steve, I turn it to you. Thanks a lot, Abby, and thanks to TVB for inviting us to participate in today's webinar. I think Rick did a great job of, of kind of setting up the metrics behind this discussion. A lot of the data that he's showing um, is, is precisely representative of what we're seeing evolve in the marketplace, um, especially in the, the ad buying and ad selling segments. What that really points to, though, is, is some of the pressure points that we're seeing and that our customers are talking to us about with regards to how 
uh, ad inventory and ad traffic is, is evolving. As we go through this transition from what was largely a linear business into a business that has to be optimized across many different platforms, those pie charts that Rick was showing, I think, really, really drive home the point that you can't build a business anymore if you're only thinking about one segment of advertising. You can't simply focus on linear. You can't simply focus on OTT or OTA. Um, you've got to build a business that is optimized across all of the <clears throat> all of the different inventory types that are now becoming part of the landscape. That challenge is is made even more. Uh, significant by the fact that we're starting to see the decline in linear ad revenue. Uh, many of our customers are, are coming to imagine and asking how we can help them continue to derive value from the linear inventory they have, and in fact, in, in many cases, see if there are ways to grow that value. But this question of fragmentation is certainly the key one, how to bring together all of these different inventory types and find ways to optimize across that re-aggregated audience and make sure that we're delivering the most value for the advertising inventory that's available. Doing that is driving a number of workflow challenges and a number of technical challenges that can best be solved by optimization and automation. Um, in doing that, we've got to find ways to solve for the high volume of campaigns that are coming in across multiple platforms and also find better ways to balance the efficiency with the buy side quality. When I talk about buy side quality, what I really mean is making sure that the, the, the aspects of advertising like brand safety, category separation, clash rules, all of those things that we've come to know as being the essential underpinnings of the TV advertising industry can be propagated across other platforms. Advertisers want to know that when they buy a piece of inventory, regardless of which, which platform they buy that inventory on, they want to make sure that their brand is being properly represented to those consumers and that their message is being most efficiently communicated to those consumers. Some of the, the research that we've done shows that uh, a vast majority of consumers, 66% of consumers, are hoping to see ads that are more relevant to them. That aligns very nicely with what we're seeing in terms of the way that the national brands are starting to use addressable advertising. When you combine the ability to address specific advertising to specific uh, segments of consumers, it really solves both of those problems at the same time. The consumer is getting ads that are more relevant, and the advertiser is getting segmentation that makes their ad more relevant. The, the, the bottom line to all of that, though, is the amount of money, the, the dollars that we're seeing shifting towards that addressable ad spend. Um, by the year 2020, the projection is that about $3.3 billion of that television ad spend is going to be reallocated towards addressable inventory. Finding ways to optimize that inventory and finding ways to automate that buy-sell transaction are going to be absolutely essential for our industry. So what is optimization when we talk about that? What we're really uh, attempting to do there is to find a way to most efficiently use the inventory to make sure that the, the inventory seller is getting the most optimal use of that inventory and to make sure that the inventory buyer is getting the most optimal use of their messaging. By building that closed loop optimization, making sure that both this, the buy side and the sell side are getting optimization out of the inventory that they're using, we get the best utilization, we get the best efficiency, and we make sure that the right ads are being delivered to the right viewer at the right time. Imagine has done a number of proof of concept projects around this. Um, using the advanced optimization engines that, that we build into our ad sales and ad traffic platforms. And we're, we're starting to see some really excellent results coming out of those POCs. So this is, this is more than theory. This is being put into practice to actually ensure that the people on the sell side are getting optimal use of the inventory that they have and that people on the buy side are getting optimal use of the dollars that they're spending. 
in one of the POCs that we ran uh, with a, a major programmer here in North America, by combining automated buy-sell with optimized uh, inventory utilization, we were able to remove almost 80% of the agencies that were involved, uh, remove about 80% of their trading workload. In, a, in another POC that we ran, the station that we uh, did this trial at um, moved to a model where they were using um, an advanced optimization en uh, engine for linear, and they were able to achieve their campaign targets for the campaigns that they ran with 75% less inventory. That's, that's a very important note because it means that they can not only get better utilization of the inventory, but it also means that they're getting higher return on the inventory because they can sell more efficiently. There was another POC that we ran with a global operator, and they were moving towards a targeted optimization scheme and were able to target the audience in that trial with 66% more efficiency than against the control group that we ran. All of those things add up to a model that says that these advanced optimization engines are capable of optimizing across much more scalable campaigns, across much more scalable platforms, and really start to bring that audience back together, re-aggregate the audience that we've seen fragmenting into those kind of sections of the pie chart that Rick was talking about a couple of minutes ago and making sure that we can optimize across that entire universe of viewers and get optimal value out of that inventory and out of that audience. Steve, it's Abby. I just wanted to uh, ask you a question about elaborating on that a little bit. A slide sure. or two before, you mentioned about the importance of growing linear value. The industry right now is underway in embracing an impression-based buying and selling model, moving away from a ratings-based model. We see that as a very important move to identifying the value of every rating point, all of the mm -hmm. people and impressions attached to every program, but we also see it as an opportunity to explore multiple platform opportunities at the local level and bring audience data at the local level to bear. So I'm curious how um, Imagine sees the move to impression-based buying as being an accelerator of growing linear value. Uh, so, so we certainly see that as being a key contributor there. Um, and in fact, you know, if you look at, at markets outside of the, the U.S. market, um, there's actually been a lot of shift already towards audience-based buying and impression-based buying. Um, one, of the, one of the largest markets that we work in is the U.K. market and they actually shifted towards impression-based buying and audience-based buying uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, and, and the data that comes out of that market suggests that inventory holders, so the people on the sell side, have the ability to optimize that audience and optimize that inventory on the basis of audience selling to achieve high single-digit, low double-digit growth um, on, a, on a compounded annual basis. So we're definitely seeing real-world proof from, from markets outside the U.S. that shows us that audience-based selling is actually a more efficient way to use the audience and a more efficient way to optimize that inventory. Thanks. That's great. And, and look, the bottom line there is if you're more efficient in using your, your inventory, you can grow your top-line dollars in terms of ad sales. You bet. Um, so what's next? Uh, some of the things that, that Imagine is going to continue to work on and some of the things that we see as being challenges across the entire uh, in, industry, um, we need to continue to make progress on how to do program schedule alterations, meaning the ability to, to do dynamic scheduling of advertising and the ability to, do, to move um, add decisions and add insertions closer towards uh, true real-time. Um, we need to continue to do work on the way that we're doing assessment of the audience, making sure that we've got better forecasting and better predictions. Um, we need to make sure that we're continuing to optimize around over-delivery. Uh, over-delivery and linear has been something that we've all talked about for many years. 
as we move closer and closer towards real time and as we move towards more dynamic ad, and, uh, ad decision engines, we're able to better balance things like pacing and delivery to ensure that, that we're not over delivering and making sure that we are getting optimal use of all of that inventory. And we also need to make sure that we can be more dynamic about making mid-campaign adjustments. We need to make sure that, that not only from the buy side, but also from the sell side, there are real-time controls that can assure that campaigns are being adjusted for optimal delivery. Um, for, for those of you that are listening in on the call today that are, are thinking about this from a business planning perspective, you're trying to make your plan and your forecasts around how to move this into production, some of the things that we'd encourage you to think about are what does a universal product catalog look like? How are you going to set up rate cards across that universal catalog? And how are you going to establish equivalency or at least comparability um, of, of measurement across these different advertising delivery types? Uh, another key topic, and, and this is one that's um, had a lot of conversation in some of the markets outside of the U.S., is the best blend between spot-based advertising and audience-based selling. There are certain programming types and certain event types that do still lend themselves to spot-based selling. Um, major sporting events is a great example. Um, we want to make sure that, that the business plans and we want to make sure that the systems are capable of, of incorporating those kinds of ideas. And then, of course, we also want people to think about um, technical and architectural flexibility. How do we keep these systems open? How do we build the right kinds of APIs uh, to, to enable integration and interoperability. And then, of course, how do we plan to move this towards uh, either private or public cloud to ensure that we've got the scale that we need in terms of computing resources and access to data? And, you know, when we talk about these advanced optimization engines, that does become an important point because running multi-pass planning and running these real-time and dynamic decisions engines it does require a fair bit of computing horsepower. And so thinking about what that deployment topology looks like and how people are actually going to build a business model around public cloud scalability becomes an important factor. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I, I invite everyone to, uh, to get better engaged with Imagine through some of our social channels. But more than anything, I'd encourage you to go to imaginecommunications.com and take a look at some of the white papers and case studies that we've already done around um, inventory optimization. There's a lot of great data out there, and we are certainly open to any questions that anyone wants to ask. Thanks so much, Steve. That was super interesting and very, very smart. Now we'll go on to Vidya's conversation with Sharita Williams. And Sharita's going to talk about, you know, as Steve mentioned, what I'd like to call real-time controls automating TV and how that enables an easier and efficient buy-sell process and how that helps to maximize local media strategies. There's no denying the importance and the effectiveness of local media. Now, how do we make all of this valuable airtime and digital space more accessible and easier to purchase and process? Vidya? Sharita? Great. Thank you, Abby, and thank you for allowing us to participate today. Um, I just wanted to start by sharing some of the benefits of automation. I think you've heard very good points from both Rick and Steve on the importance of local embracing some of these changes that are coming about and, and how it helps. I really see automation as the foundation for a lot of the things that we're talking about here today. And so I just wanted to start with kind of a, a reset on some of the benefits that automation enables for local. So first of all, by reducing the manual time and sort of cons the manual time consuming steps to buying local, we believe existing dollars remain in spot and could potentially even increase since the execution model becomes more competitive with other mediums. I think everyone's very aware of the pain points that exist in the marketplace, and you can really just think of automation as helping to take some of those pain points out and make it easier for buyers to access the inventory. Similarly, on the, um, when it comes to new dollars to the marketplace, we think automation just basically, in the same way that it makes it easier for existing buyers to reach TV stations, it also makes it easier for new advertisers who've never bought TV before to get access to that inventory, including some of these direct-to-consumer brands that we're hearing so much about in the press lately. But the, the idea is that um, automation enables a, a better pathway to your inventory, both for existing and new advertisers, and that's what's going to lead to the growth that we want to see on the local side and kind of counter some of those trends that you saw in the pie, chart, pie charts earlier. 
Third, we think that one of the clearest benefits we've seen so far, we, we have a, a tool called Campaign Performance that really provides kind of real-time visibility to how campaigns are performing during the life of the campaign. And what it's, what's happened is that it's provided both quicker and better visibility to the buyers, and it's led to better performance overall for their advertisers. And that type of transparency is really only possible when the systems are connected and the data can flow easily, and so that's a big part of, of what automation enables. And finally, bringing automation and, and data-driven sales uh, to linear positions those broadcast impressions to be sold in conjunction with other video impressions in the market, whether it's OTT or digital video, and eventually it, it sets you up to be able to sell those impressions on even an addressable basis when ATSC 3.0 scales. So overall, automation is really making TV take on some of the attributes of digital and other forms of video, which levels the playing field and increases the effectiveness for our advertisers. Sharita, before you go on, a question came in that I think would be good to address at this point. And the question okay. is, are we really talking about just national advertisers and what's coming out of national spot, or is there a play here across optimization and automated television for the mom and pop local businesses as well? I think it applies to the smaller advertisers and smaller agencies as well. It's, I, I don't think that they are the first to adopt. What we're seeing in terms of the early adopters is on the national side. The national folks are the ones that have the greatest pain in trying to aggregate across all these different markets. But even you know, regionally and locally, I, I, there are advertisers that want to buy, plan their media plan across all of their impressions in the marketplace in a more holistic way. And until linear impressions are online alongside the other impressions in the marketplace, it's difficult for them to do that. So I, I, do, I do think it applies to everyone. It's just being adopted quicker on the national side. Thanks, Sharita. And when we get to Q&A, Steve, I'm going to ask you that question, too, because I think there's an optimization angle on this as well. Great. So given those benefits, we have worked really hard to try and bring automation across the entire broadcast, broadcast workflow. So you can see here the kind of beginning to end workflow across the middle, inventory management all the way to invoicing, and the different buy side systems across the top and the different sell side and, and data systems on the bottom. We have had API connectivity with some of these players like MediaOcean and Freewheel for a number of years. And now with the help of the TIP initiative, we're starting to expand direct integrations with additional partners on both the buy and the sell side. And I just want to emphasize again, it really is only through true integrations, not kind of manual file movements back and forth, that the workflows get easier. And so this is where uh, much of our focus is currently. You can see on this next slide our solution for um, a sort of TIP sales gateway. We are fully supporting the TIP interface framework and building out data exchange APIs that are in compliance with that guidance. This is the solution that we've offered up to the broadcasters to be live by end of year. It enables both the broadcasters and our demand partners to interface with our services via the TIP framework. So we're basically taking each piece of the workflow that you saw on that prior slide and changing the external interfaces so that they are, comply with the, the TIP standards. And we're working really closely with other vendors in the space who are also supportive of TIP to do this. And, and the reason we're all engaged and, and willing to do that is because it really does provide flexibility and choice for broadcasters and buyers in terms of their, their workflows. It's, it's a really big problem to solve in terms of making all of this stuff more efficient and more automated. And so, you know, working together enables folks to, to solve different pieces of it, you know, at different speeds than others and for everything to work together for everyone's benefit. So in terms of our APIs, we have taken an open source approach. We, um, we've published specifications for inventory, pre and post logs, proposals, orders and make goods, and we'll make those available to anyone that, that wants to partner with us. Um, one example of that is we're partnering with Sinclair and Imagine for driving and implementing the TIP standards around the exchange of inventory data. The inventory API essentially automates the flow of inventory rates and ratings between inventory systems, such as uh, the ones Imagine and others provide into platforms like ours or into buy side systems. Once these standards and these APIs are in place, they can really be leveraged for you know, any vendor that wants to come in and innovate on that side of the workflow to take advantage of the access to that information. So that's, that's really how this is starting to come about, and we're very excited about the partnership that we have with these folks here and, and others in the marketplace to, to really start to make these TIP standards and, and framework tangible. 
So, you know, our, our overarching position is that we want to make it as easy as possible for dollars to flow to local TV. And anyone interested in collaborating, please contact us at info at video.tv. Thank you. Thanks, Sharita. That was terrific. And that uh, really helped to explain what's going on on the technical side and bringing interoperability to the industry as well. So now we're going to move into our Q&A segment. Um, one of the questions that came up early on in the session, but I wanted to hold it till now, is a question about the move to the use of digital inventory by advertisers and a question about why some of that may be occurring. Um, and the, specifically, the question says, is this due to limited inventory? So I expect that this probably came from a political advertiser um, who faces a lot of limited inventory issues on linear television in some day parts um, during political season, or it may be from a general market advertiser who feels squeezed out during political season due to the onslaught of political ads. So Rick, I'm going to I'm going to put this one on you to start off with, and what's your sense about you know inventory congestion, if you will, um, and how that might be impacting dollars moving to other platforms? Well, sure. I mean, it, it's definitely a factor. So, I'll give a, a quick case study. Um, one of our uh, clients uh, is in the digital inventory side of the business, and. Um, they had a client that bought local TV as well as uh, digital video, and what was happening, uh, this is the last cycle, but we're coming into the next election cycle. Uh, what they saw is particularly in the local news uh, time slot, that they were getting priced out and the inventory was going, uh, but they still had their goals to get to certain impressions, and they liked video uh, as a medium, uh, and they liked local TV, and they tried to reach audiences that they couldn't reach with local TV, with their digital platform extensions. And so they, uh, you know, our client came to us and said, what do we do? This person wants to buy more TV um, and do we put them into digital video? And, and basically, you know, our, our response was, yeah, I mean, if you can get to the target audiences on these different platforms, and for whatever reason you're priced out of your local TV station uh, because of demand and inventory from political um, sources, um, that's what the audience is, and if you can reach them, then, then go ahead and do that. Uh, so that's, that's um, kind of a factor that I think local TV faces as it does optimize uh, in inventory, and in both in terms of the demand side and the supply side and getting to it. But, but one, one thing, I'll go back to the, the question about the, the local businesses and what both Steve and Sharita were, were saying about ATSC 3.0, a.k.a. next-gen TV. Um, that demand um, can expand. I mean, the inventory can expand as uh, next-gen TV allows geotargeting, so you can split that uh, inventory up and service small clients who don't need the full DMA reach, for example, and still have the ability to um, get impressions from the rest of the market. So I, I think as we start to move into OTT platforms that broadcasters are offering, and as we do get into next-gen TV, uh, there'll be more inventory for that premium video that um, uh, larger advertisers and even a smaller advertisers want, and the ability to split that by zone and add some more pricing flexibility to reach audience targets, I think is going to be good news for both the buy side and sell side going forward. Yeah, that seems that's a, that's a really good comprehensive answer. I'd like to add to that for both our uh, agency customers that are on the call today and, and also our station members, that, you know, during political crunch time, um, it's not a crunch everywhere. So, you know, all of those dollars go mostly into 10 states um, and the markets that are impacted, and there's plenty, plenty of other markets and states around the country where there's lots of inventory. Um, plus, there are many day parts that aren't as saturated with political advertising. So there are lots of opportunities on your local television station, around news and other day parts that get a lot of attention. Um, but there are many, many ways, and especially as we move to impression-based buying and we can find greater value, audience data value, in other programs and other day parts, there's lots and lots of opportunities. Um, so with that in mind, Steve, I'm going to ask you that question again. As we talk about optimization and we talk about giving tools to sellers and buyers, um, do you see this as mostly a national solution, or what do you see um, about helping out those local direct advertisers? Uh, so we think it has benefit across the entire landscape. Um, and in fact, I, I actually think that the the smaller uh, local buyers are actually going to be one of the groups that benefits first. 
and the reason for that is because they we need these optimization tools enable in order to be able to find the right inventory at the right price for those um, those ad buyers to be able to enter into the ecosystem and and that does require you know some of these kinds of advanced um, inventory planning and inventory optimization tools that that we've been talking about today um, when you know, in a world where you haven't started to automate that, in a world where you haven't, um, you know, started to look at some of the the APIs and interfaces and buy sell exchange that that Sharita was talking about earlier, um, that that's very difficult. But as we move more towards this kind of online automated buying and selling, and as we move more towards a really advanced optimization engine that can that can match up the right order with the right audience. Um, I think you're going to see that things really do broaden out, um, and then it becomes an ecosystem that's inclusive of advertisers all the way from the biggest to the smallest. Now that makes a lot of sense to us as well. And just building on that, Sharita, you know, there's a question that came in about a recent announcement from Vidya about video ratings. Can you tell us more about how they work? Sure, absolutely. So. We have developed algorithmic ratings estimates that look at historical data and predict forward what we believe the, the ratings are likely to be on a station-by-station -station basis. It's by demo, it's by playback type, it's um, you know every station, every market. And we found that to bring a lot of efficiencies to the ratings estimation process. It may not be something that you know folks want to rely on holistically, you know, without um, kind of adding additional analysis around the time periods that, that have a lot of variability, like prime sports and specials, but it is, you know, absolutely a, a way to kind of focus people's efforts on the areas where they get the greatest return on their time. And so uh, we have interest in the ratings estimates from both the buy side and the sell side, and it's just a huge amount of kind of repetitive manual um, work that happens on an ongoing basis that we're trying to, to help alleviate and, and, and really have folks focus on, on where they get, they, they add the most value, whether it's the, the programming that's changing constantly or, you know, the sales process itself. So that's, that's what we've recently brought to market. So that question, you know, leads us to talk about optimizing people and time and time spent doing all of these things. Um, and we got a question as you were speaking, Sharita, that's, you know, always sort of the elephant in the room, and I think it's, it's a, you know, important question to address head on. And it says, will, you know, will this automation and optimization eliminate local sales positions? Yeah, I think that's a fair question, and it's certainly one that we've heard quite a number of times. Um, I, I think if you look at what's happened in other industries, whether it's digital or, you know, any other form of marketing, the, the automation and, and programmatic tools that have come about haven't necessarily eliminated people. The skill sets tend to change over time, and the way people spend their time certainly changes, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, but, you, I mean, there are more people selling digital now than there, there ever were. It's not that they've gone away. It's, it's really, you know, you have an opportunity to tell the story differently and, and leverage the data and the tools in, in different ways to, to gain an edge over your competitors. So, I think what's happening is these platforms and automation in general is really, you know, enabling a, a different type of conversation, a different type of sell, and really taking a lot of that, you know, 60% plus time that people spend on administrative and, um, you know, chasing down stuff that really doesn't add value to an advertiser, changing that 60% into, you know, being thoughtful and having data and um, results that, that prove your case and, and help to gain your share. So, no, I, I don't think they go away. I do think it changes over time, though, just like, you know, other industries. Thank you for taking that on head on. So sure. we have one last question. I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to put this back to Sharita for starters and, and then maybe um, to Steve. It's a, kind of a straightforward one. How can my agency get involved with testing all of these new platforms and, uh, and systems? Uh, you can reach out to me directly with my email address you see there, sharita.williams at video.tv, and we can get a test going uh, wherever you like. Uh, we're, we're anxious to get our solution in front of more folks, and, and we do think we provide visibility and, and transparency that, that doesn't exist elsewhere. So I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Steve? Yeah, so first of all, I'd certainly encourage people to get involved in some of the industry initiatives that are going on, like the, the TIP initiative that Sharita referenced earlier. 
um, you know, we find that through those collaborations and those discussions around, um, you know, things like open APIs and, and open source projects, we really have brought together a great community of people that are, are thought leaders and that want to engage in the kinds of uh, POCs and, and experiments that, that your question references. Um, from, from our standpoint, you know, we Imagine works primarily with people who are on the sell side. Um, so, you know, we, we are happy to talk with people on the agency side that want to get engaged, but in general it's going to involve a third party. It's going to involve someone that's actually uh, uh, actually has inventory to sell and, and lives on the sell side. But if you want to reach out to me, my, my address is there on the screen and I'm happy to get you plugged in with everybody that we're working with um, to conduct those kinds of experiments. And Rick, I'm going to give you a chance to answer too because I know clients ask you all the time. Well, sure. I mean, so you can set up your own um, kind of A-B testing. You can work with companies like Video and Imagine to, to see what they can bring to it. And we're seeing all different kinds of experimentation going on in the industry, both uh, on the buy side. I was reading one article in the trade press about an agency, a major agency that was looking at attribution, for example. You spoke about that earlier, Abby. Um, how does that inform what's going on and optimize what we're investing in local TV? And, uh, in that case, they um, uh, purchased the services of three different attribution vendors to compare and contrast um, what, what it looked like they were getting. So, I mean, I think that spirit of innovation and uh, actually investing money into the medium uh, for both the buy side and sell side is, is absolutely critical for learning and better deployment of advertising investments um, and optimizing the inventory. So it's, it's great to see um, sort of a, I'm not even sure if it's a resurgence or just a surge, uh, new kind of excitement about what we can do with these technologies and the workflows and how we can really better solve uh, the advertising problem, how to get more people in front of that message at the right time in the, in the journey purchase um, uh, path. That's great. Well, thank you all for, um, for the contributions that you made today, for the, the smart and thoughtful presentations. Um, we would just want to remind everyone on the phone today that the TVB Forward Conference is coming up on September 26th, where we'll be having in-depth conversations about measurements specifically on the adoption of impression-based buying and selling. The TIP initiative, there will be upwards of eight different case study presentations of real quantifiable and scalable benefits to the industry. And we have super sessions for political and automotive. So there's something for everybody there. Um, you can go to tvb.org and find out more about the Forward Conference. Um, many, many thanks to BIA and Rick and Imagine and Steve and Vidya and Sharita um, for not only being our thought leader sponsors all through the year, but for taking the time today to share their vision with all of us. So uh, thank you from TVB and enjoy the rest of your summer. <laughs>